Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Prelude to Space by Arthur C. Clarke, a novel which breaks the time barrier, contains startling prophecies of man's future in space. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... Mankind's future is at stake, a crowded planet, the menace of the intercontinental ballistic weapon. Is the rocket a means of salvation, or is it a threat to the human race? This novel deals with the men in the spaceships that they are trying to launch. Unconscious rebels, they are trying to break the bounds of the Earth in inner space. Will they succeed? Will the great ships lift an orbit into worlds beyond man's ken? This is exciting stuff, history in the making, a fictional projection of fact which is alarmingly exact. And it really is, I mean, the tabs that I've got for you to, to share right now are from the preface. Uh, he says, he wrote it, well, I'll just read it out. I wrote Prelude to Space in July 1947 during my summer vacation as a student at King's College London. The writing took exactly 20 days, a record I have never since approached. This speed was largely due to the fact that I had been planning the book for more than a year and had made voluminous notes. It was already well organised in my head before I set pen to paper. Um, and considering it was written in 1947, it's, it's alarmingly uh, prophetic, you know. And this the introduction was actually written in 1961, and this is also prophetic. He says, uh, I was a little more conservative, though few would have agreed in 1947, in putting the first manned suborbital flight in 1962, and the first orbital flight in 1970. Certainly no reasonable person would have imagined that the second feat would have been achieved before the first, and as early as 1961. I have, no date that my de I have no doubt that my date for the lunar landing, 1978, will prove equally pessimistic. And obviously it did. We get a reference to boffins as well, and someone goes, Boffins? Good lord, don't you know that word? It goes back to the war and means any long-haired scientific type with a slide rule in his vest pocket. Um, my book has started to fall apart, as you can probably see. So, um, I'm hoping I don't lose pages before I get around to reviewing them. I like the fact they're talking about the Prometheus, the spaceship. The Prometheus of legend had brought fire from heaven down to earth. The Prometheus of the 20th century was to take atomic fire back into the home of the gods and to prove that man, by his own exertions, had broken free at last from the chains that had held him to this world for a million years. And I thought what was cool about this as well, he talks about this ship and it's, it's like a dual stage one. It's got like, um, you know, it's just not... That's how rockets tend to work. You have the booster and then the command module or whatever. So he says that here. Um, Circling patiently, Beta would wait until the spaceship returned. At the end of its half million mile journey, Alpha would have barely enough fuel to manoeuvre into a parallel orbit. The crew and their equipment would then be transferred to the waiting Beta, which would still carry sufficient fuel to bring them safely back to Earth. It was an elaborate plan, but even with atomic energy, it was still the only practicable way of making the lunar round trip with a rocket weighing not less than many thousands of tons. Moreover, it had many other advantages. Alpha and Beta could each be designed to carry out their separate tasks with an efficiency which no single all-purpose ship could hope to achieve. It was impossible to combine in one machine the ability to fly through Earth's atmosphere and to land on the airless moon. And so there's this joke when they're talking about, oh, who's funding this spaceship? And um, Matthews goes, don't forget our most important contribution to industry. What's that? The import of high-grade vacuums for filling electric light bulbs and electronic tubes. Um, which is a fun little joke. And then uh, we get the we use the word facetiousness, which is a word that I enjoy a lot. We get a reference to a Jules Verne. And then we get this great line, um, This sort of things makes the British very disconcerting people to a foreigner. Of course, McAndrews would say that it's the English, not the British, who are crazy. But I refuse to draw this rather fine distinction. So uh, the character called Sam, uh, he's got a cigarette and it's asked, Did he use glue to keep it dangling from his lower lip at that improbable angle? Which I enjoyed. And he's got a, a concept called futilitarianism. Which is obviously a portmanteau of futile and utilitarianism, which I thought was fun. And so they're talking about this trip to the moon, um, whether it's going to be a good thing or not. Will that make the world a better or a happier place? That, as always, depends on humanity. Knowledge is neutral, but one must possess it to do either good or ill. Interesting line there. And then there are some people in orbit, and we get the line, uh, they would stay in their orbit until they were quite satisfied with their tests, unless, as the chief engineer had remarked, they were forced down earlier by a shortage of cigarettes. Um, which is kind of funny, but also, obviously, you can't imagine that these days that there would be cigarettes in space like that just seems like a recipe for disaster you know um my book is falling apart some more this one definitely will not be going on my ebay store after i've finished it i guess i do like it though because if i was taking this on a rocket this would actually be how they would read it like they would read a page and then they would tear the page off and they would read the next page and they would tear the page off and the point would be to uh, keep the weight down so that it, it didn't uh, do too much damage 
to the payload and all of that. They don't they don't they want, don't want to take any weight that they can avoid. Uh, and there was I can't remember where I read it. I think it was in a, a science fiction novel, but a mention of a character who, uh, or maybe it was real, I can't remember. But anyway, the idea was they cut off all of the uh, white spaces at the end of their maps, again, to keep the weight down as low as possible. Anything that they don't need, they don't take. So Dirk says the uh, atomic drive in the Prometheus is a complete mystery to him. Collins gave a puzzled little grim. That baffles us, he complained. From the technical point of view, it's far simpler than the internal combustion engine, which everyone understands perfectly. But for some reason, people assume that an atomic drive must be incomprehensible, so they won't even make an effort to understand it. A little bit about the moon here, and we get a reference to C.S. Lewis as well. Both, both of these are interesting, so I'm just going to read out the paragraphs. That it would be very easy to bombard the Earth from the moon, and very difficult to attack the moon from the Earth, have made many uninhibited military experts declare that, for the sake of peace, their particular country must seize our satellite before any warmongering rival could reach it. Such arguments were common in the decade following the release of atomic energy, and were a typical byproduct of that era's political paranoia. They died unlamented as the world slowly returned to sanity and order. A second, and perhaps more important, body of opinion, while admitting that interplanetary travel was possible, opposed it on mystical or religious grounds. The theological opposition, as it was usually termed, believed that man would be disobeying some divine edict if he ventured away from his world. In the phrase of interplanetary's earliest and most brilliant critic, the Oxford Don C.S. Lewis, astronomical distances were God's quarantine regulations. If man overcame them, he would be guilty of something not far removed from blasphemy. I enjoy this as well. It was one of Matthew's unfulfilled ambitions to be visited simultaneously by a flat earther and one of those still more eccentric people who were convinced that the world is on the inside of a hollow sphere. And so uh, we get this epic speech um, which ends, We who have striven to place humanity upon the road to the stars make this solemn declaration, now and for the future, we will take no frontiers into space. Um, and that's uh, an idea that Clark is, you know, very fond of and that he, he still stood by in his introduction, you know. Oh, and they're talking about how much uh, Prometheus costs. Uh, and they, they go, Professor Maxim once calculated that the ships cost about 10 million pounds in research and 5 millions in direct construction. Maybe times that by a thousand, put it into billions, you might be closer to how much they actually cost. And they're talking about how people, you know, people don't want them to, to leave the earth. Um, and he's saying, the planets I see now are no further away than our minds will make them. It will take the Prometheus a hundred hours to reach the moon, and all the time she will be speaking to Earth, and the eyes of the world will be upon her. How little a thing interplanetary travel seems if we match it against the weeks and the months and the years of the great voyages of the past. Everything is relative, and the time will surely come when our minds embrace the solar system as now they do the Earth. Then, I suppose, when the scientists are looking thoughtfully towards the stars, many will cry, we don't want interstellar flight. The nine planets were good enough for our grandfathers, and they're good enough for us. And at the start of chapter 16, I think this is just interesting because it's true. It says, It would be false to suggest that the five men on whom the eyes of the world were now fixed regarded themselves as daring adventurers, about to risk their lives in a stupendous scientific gamble. They were all practical, hard-headed technicians who had no intention of taking part in a gamble of any kind, at least where their lives were concerned. There was a risk, of course, but one took risks when one caught the 810 to the city. And someone ends up in Hyde Park and we get, The next speaker was engaged on proving, apparently with the aid of biblical text, that doomsday was at hand. He reminded Dirk of those apocalyptic prophets of the anxious year 999. Would their successors, ten centuries later, still be predict predicting the day of wrath as the year 1999 drew to its close? He could hardly doubt it. In many ways, human nature changed very little. The prophets would still be there and there would still be some to believe them. And it's very true, I mean, we had the, you know, the YQ Y2K bug and things like that that people were worried about. And uh, Hassel meets some kids and he goes, uh, These urchins appear to be playing truant from Dr. Fagan's Academy for Young Delinquents. Which I just thought, fantastic there. Little reference to Oliver Twist, but just great writing as well. And Dirk goes, After listening to that talk, I must say that the universe doesn't sound a very attractive place. It's not surprising that a lot of people would prefer to stay at home. We get a reference to the pilots only coming in handy when there's an issue. On the remaining 999 occasions of a thousand, the pilot's simply there because he weighs less than the automatic machinery that could do the same job. But obviously these days, the machinery would be much lighter. And, um... Some fun here as well. Listen, he said, there's one thing I've been meaning to have out with you for some time. What sex is the Prometheus? Everyone seems to use he, she, or it quite impartially. I don't expect scientists to understand grammar, but still, Collins chuckled. That's just the kind of point we are particular about, he said. It's been laid down officially somewhere. Although Prometheus is, of course, he, we call the entire ship she, as in nautical practice. Beta is also she, but Alpha, the spaceship, isn't it? What could be simpler? It's like uh, gender pronouns, trying to get those right. So let's talk about the atomic thing that's used to, to, you know, to fly this rocket or whatever. 
And uh, Collins goes, there's no danger of an explosion here. The fissile material we use is all denatured. If we went to a lot of trouble, we could get an explosion, but a very small one. What do you mean by that? Asked Dirk suspiciously. Oh, just a large bang, said Collins cheerfully. I couldn't give the figures offhand, but it would probably be no better than a few hundred tons of dynamite. Nothing to worry about at all. Yeah, that sounds like nothing to worry about. And um, Professor Maxton here is talking about whether we'll, we'll ever meet intelligent life. And I assume this is kind of what Clark himself thinks, you know? Um, I think we'll get to the stars someday. How? If we can get an atomic drive that's more than 50% efficient, we can reach nearly the velocity of light, perhaps three quarters of it at any rate. That means it's about five years travelling from star to star. A long time, but still possible even for us short-lived creatures. And one day, I hope, we'll live a lot longer than we do today. A heck of a lot longer. And this reminded me of this description of Tane. It could be a description of me. Tane was a slightly plump young man who seemed scarcely in the middle 20s, though he was actually just under 30. Uh... Uh, no wonder that Richards at 35 was considered quite an old crock by his colleagues. I'm 34, mate. And this is fascinating too. It sounds paradoxical, but it's easier to make the 40 million mile journey from a lunar base to Mars than it is to cross the quarter of a million miles between Earth and Moon. It takes much longer, of course, about 250 days, but it doesn't take more fuel. And uh, that's why the Moon is so important. It's the stepping stone to the planets. And indeed, that's pretty much why we're looking at getting people back at the Moon now in, uh, in reality. And it's talking about um, going to Jupiter and perhaps Saturn. Very probably these expeditions will start from Mars. We cannot, of course, hope to land on those two planets. If they have solid surfaces at all, which is doubtful, they are thousands of miles down beneath an atmosphere we dare not enter. If there is any form of life inside those subarctic infernos, I don't see how we can ever contact it, or how it can ever know anything about us. The chief interest of Saturn and Jupiter lies in their systems and moons. Saturn has at least 12, Jupiter at least 15. What's more, many of them are fair-sized worlds, bigger than our moon. Titan, Saturn's largest satellite, is half as big as Earth, and it's known to have an atmosphere, though not a breathable one. They're all very cold indeed, but that is not a serious objection now that we can get unlimited quantities of heat from atomic reactions. And we have a printing error here, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but the top line on this page is actually printed twice, this page here. Yeah, you can just about see that. It's a fun little printing error to pick up on, you know? I love this little quote here. Uh, the Director General did not like waiting. It gave him time to think and thought was the enemy of contentment. Alrighty, so uh, I am still quite ill, so apologies for my voice, but uh, that is all I tabbed out in Prelude to Space. Overall, I gave it a strong 3.5 out of 5. I thought it was very good, very interesting. Uh, really cool to see Arthur C. Clarke's take on um, what a mission to the moon might look like, especially considering it was written in like the 40s, the late 40s, and then uh, the version I had was like revised in the early 60s, so it was kind of cool to see how accurate he was, you know? So, um, yeah, that was that was good. That was a, a 3.5. So there we have it, that's what I thought of Prelude to Space by Arthur C. Clarke. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.